Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. And for those of you that are joining us for the very first time, welcome. It's great to have you here. Go ahead, take a moment and introduce yourself in the comments. You're going to love the Dadvice TV community. Tons of great people here helping you kick kidney disease to the curve and improve your quality of life while well, you happen to have kidney disease. Now, for those of you that are new, let me quickly introduce myself. My name is James and yeah, I have kidney disease. Diagnosed a few years ago, stage five, told I had to go on dialysis and get a transplant. Well, I never did any of that. Instead, I worked very closely with my doctors, including a renal dietitian, As a matter of fact, multiple renal dietitians to help me focus on being healthy. And along the way with being healthy, I learned to eat better. I learned to get my blood sugar under control. I got my blood pressure under control. I started being a bit more active. Now I'm not out there doing gymnastics or swimming or anything like that. No, I'm taking walks. I'm playing with the dog and things like that. Simple, easy things. And as I focused on my health, my lab started improving also. I am much, much healthier now, not at risk of needing dialysis. I feel fantastic. And as you can tell, I am loaded with energy. And this, this live show right here, this is me at the end of a long, difficult day of work. Yeah, with kidney disease, awesome. But the thing that really helped me the most was learning about kidney disease, learning about nutrition, which is what we're gonna talk about today, a key part of nutrition. Now, when many of us, I would say practically all of us, when we get diagnosed with kidney disease, no matter how little bit of kidney disease we have, you could be stage, stage two, stage three, we all go and we look online. And it is very common for us to see certain things like watch your sodium, make sure you're correctly hydrated, um, watch your phosphorus, the sneaky snake in there, and be careful for potassium. Now we see that everywhere on the, the dialysis websites, all the kidney websites, they talk about potassium. But I'm here to let you guys know, we don't all have to always reduce potassium. As a matter of fact, potassium can be helpful, but there may be times when your healthcare provider your doctors, your dietitian, not a Facebook group, no, 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 not somebody on YouTube, but your healthcare team may tell you, you need to look at a low potassium diet. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And what is the best source to learn about low potassium diets? From a renal dietitian. So you guys know who's here today? It's Tuesday, it's Jen Hernandez. Hey Jen, how you doing? Hey, James, I'm doing great. So excited. Really, really excited. I say that every week, but always excited to talk about really specifics with the renal diet and to help clarify something like potassium. That is probably one of the most confusing things across the board for the renal diet. So super excited to get into that. And I'll just uh, do my little introduction for anyone who has not met me before or has not seen our Tuesday evening shows. My name is Jen Hernandez. I am a renal dietitian. So I'm a registered dietitian here in the United States, and I'm also board certified in renal nutrition. And that is what I do for my full time job. I have a virtual private practice that is plant-powered kidneys, so you can find information about my practice and a lot of information on my website at plantpoweredkidneys.com. And right now, actually tonight, last week I announced that the Plant Powered Kidneys course, which is a six-week online course, was open for enrollment. The early bird offer has ended, but we have just a little bit of time left for anyone who is thinking about joining our six week course. So we are already up and running. Students are already in enjoying the course going through week one, which just so happens to be about potassium. 
learning a ton of information there, getting the recipes, looking at the meal plan, and getting ready for our live Q&A that will be happening on Thursday for students. So if you are interested in joining, now is your last chance to join until the end of the year. I only have this program open a couple times a year, but so it's either now or wait until the fall. Uh, but if you're interested, I really, really recommend you get in there because there is so much information and you don't want to sit and wait because if you do that, you run the risk of missing out on a lot of opportunities when you have uh, an earlier stage or earlier situation. So really hoping to uh, welcome some new students. We have a great amount of new students and returning students joining us for this round of PPK. But for tonight, we are going to focus on a lot of that information that we do cover for week one right here tonight, which is specifically about the low potassium diet. In the course, we talk about all ranges of potassium, but tonight we're really going to hone in on low potassium because a lot of people are told to follow a low potassium diet, but it gets really confusing as to what that means. And they oftentimes over restrict and we do not want that. <laughs> Exactly. And I, I think almost every kidney patient out there makes that mistake in the beginning where they're over restricting. We see something that says, hey, limit or watch this. Mm -hmm. And we just put the brakes on it, which could also put us in some other problems by going too low. So let's mm -hmm. kind of jump back to the beginning, some of the basics in case we got people who are here new and they didn't hear us talk about potassium in previous episodes. Mm -hmm. What is potassium and why is it important? So potassium is the third most abundant mineral in our body. And this is, this is right behind in line from calcium and phosphorus, which are two other really important nutrients. And we did do that other episode talking about electrolytes and we covered the, the functions, the purposes and, and where you find them in the body for potassium. It's so crucial in helping our fluid restriction and our fluid balance. It helps with our nerve signaling. It helps with our heartbeat. So your heart contraction relies on the right amount of potassium and the same same thing goes for muscle work and muscle contractions. Our potassium level helps with regulating those contractions. And of course, the heart is arguably one of the most important muscles in the body. So it makes sense that potassium, if it's helping with muscle contractions, is also helping with our heartbeat. So it is so, so important. And even with chronic kidney disease, potassium is not something to limit entirely. It is mm. not something to avoid because your body still needs to use potassium for those kinds of functions. Yeah, and at some points or at the higher stages, potassium is actually protective and good for you. Um, actually, at all stages, potassium is good for you. Too much is where the problem mm -hmm. comes in. And at those lower stages, when your kidneys aren't functioning as well, you tend to build up that potassium. Now, exactly. how does, and I kind of gave it away a little bit, how does kidney disease impact potassium? Well, yeah, you. I mean, that's basically it. Our kidneys help with regulating how much potassium we keep in our body and how much potassium we release from our waste. So we get rid, rid of it through urine and bowel movements, which if you've ever experienced high potassium, one of the medications that your doctor might prescribe to help drop your potassium really fast is a medication called kaxalate or lactulose. Those medications basically induce diarrhea. So it's not a fun method, but those uncontrolled potassium levels are that serious that your body needs to get rid of that potassium before it overrides those uh, nerve contractions, those muscle contractions, your heartbeat. So if you've had that experience before, you know that it's not pleasant, but it's very, very crucial to keep it in range. And over time with CKD, it may, not always, but it may accumulate in the body because of that decreased kidney function. And then for dialysis, there's only so much that can be removed from treatment. And again, we've talked about it before where dialysis is covering a fraction. It's covering a percent of what your kidneys had mm -hmm. done before. Your kidneys are working all the time, nonstop filtering everything. And when you have to make that transition to dialysis, that turns into 
a few hours a day, a few times a week rather than 24 seven. So there's a trade off there and, and it's a tough balance for the quality of life, but this is a necessity in many cases. Yep. And what are some of the symptoms if my potassium gets too high? So many symptoms, they may or may not be present. And I can say I've had patients on dialysis who've had a potassium in the sevens and eights. So for the record, a normal potassium will be around 3.5, 3.7 up to 5, 5.1. That's where like the normal range will be in your labs above 5.1 into those mid fives. That's in the like, uh, we're kind of, we're, we're going to be cautious about this. And then over into the sixes and above that's high potassium. And that's something that can cause cardiac arrest where your heart stops. But I've had patients on dialysis uh, who have had a high potassium level and they don't feel a thing. I've also had patients with high potassium that do feel it. So some of those symptoms can be nausea or vomiting. They can be uh, numbness or tingling, especially um, in many, well, in some cases I'll say there is a sense of like paralysis. I, I, I'll never forget one of my patients telling me he knew his potassium was too high when he couldn't get out of bed because his muscles were basically paralyzed oh. and how scary is that to wake yeah. up and not be able to get out of bed yeah I and mean, that's like a nightmare you have growing up mm -hmm. where you can't move i couldn't imagine that happening in real life yeah yeah it's it's really quite terrifying and i'll say like the silver lining is he didn't die so that's good but yeah. it, it's not like the paralysis is anything to be cheering over either so these high potassium symptoms can be very very scary and life-threatening uh, you may also experience a low pulse or kind of a rear a weird irregular heartbeat and the thing with the low potassium symptoms is mm -hmm. they can be very similar to high potassium so you still have that risk of cardiac arrest and this is why I want to talk about the low potassium diet and not the no potassium diet, not this idea that right. zero is good because these health complications can happen even with not getting enough potassium in the diet. So the same problems, uh, one of the things constipation that can happen, and that's really your body trying to hold on to potassium. It's, 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 not able to eliminate the waste because you don't have enough to get rid of. So constipation is one of the side effects. You can still experience the muscle weakness or those twitching or tingling or spasms. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have that irregular heartbeat as well. So this, the symptoms are on either side pretty similar and you can't quite tell just off a of symptom if that's what it is. But um, it's definitely important to speak with your doctor if you notice any of these kinds of signs or symptoms because it could be life-threatening. Yeah, and when I was diagnosed, my potassium was, it says critical. Um, mine was critically low and I'm mm -hmm. a little bit unique in that I have difficulty holding on to potassium, um, which is something I didn't realize could be a problem, but it could be. And mm -hmm. I experienced a lot of those, those symptoms along with everything else as my kidneys were failing. Um, mm -hmm. One question before we move on to learning more about the potassium, if, who should tell me that I need to be on a low potassium diet? That's such an important question. Yeah, <laughs> ideally it's your dietitian. And the reason I say that is because, um, I've had a lot of people, a lot, a lot of clients tell me that their doctors, I mean, even today, um, I, I had a new client, we were saying, okay, so what's your doctor told you about the diet? Mm -hmm. Nothing really specific, just gave me a stack of handouts. And Sounds normal. in that stack, yeah, yeah. And in that stack of handouts is a low potassium diet guideline, which mm -hmm. if the low potassium diet is appropriate, then that would work. But what if, so like in your case, James, what if your doctor just gave you that stack and says well, that's potassium. what happened actually. Yeah. I was just given generic documents like, hey, here's about kidney disease. Your heart's not doing too good. Here's about heart disease and what, mm -hmm. you just need to read both of these, figure it out. And that's where my primary care physician told me, look, we gotta focus on nutrition and what you eat. No processed food right now. I want you to, mm -hmm. you know, none of this, 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 make an appointment 
with the renal dietitian. That's your next step. <laughs> but in yeah. the meantime, no processed food, no fast food. You're drinking water. <laughs> you know, that, mm -hmm. he, he pretty much got me in an okay spot and told me, go talk to an expert like you to yeah. learn how to eat. And he told me, throw away all those papers you got. They're, they're wrong. Yeah. I, I brought them in. He says, I, we're throwing them away. You, low potassium, you need potassium. You're going to be on a higher potassium diet. Um, mm -hmm. It's not high. It's higher, I would say. Right. Um, right. But if I would have followed that, I could have ended up back in the ER, back in the ICU with problems. Because I did go extreme on the sodium. I mm. tried to do zero sodium and mm -hmm. oh my goodness, that did not go well. I was back at the doctor and he's talking to me. He's like, okay, how, how much sodium are you getting per, per day? And I said, doc, I'm doing my best. I'm trying to get to zero, but I can't. There's sodium in eggs. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing that doesn't have it. And he's like, you're not supposed to be at zero. And potassium is the same thing. You're not supposed yeah. to be at zero because then you're going to go too low. Exactly. So at least we got the important thing. You do not go on a low potassium diet because you read it online, because mm -hmm. it was in a handout uh, that was in a stack of papers of general generic information, or because somebody in Facebook said to do it, or because someone has the same GFR as you and they're on a low potassium diet. Mm -mm 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 -mm. We're right, all that doesn't have unique. Yeah, that does, does doesn't have to do with it. And uh, secondary to a dietitian if your doctor is telling you to follow a low potassium, like specifies, if your doctor specifies, you need to restrict your potassium, that obviously you want to follow the doctor's guidelines. If you don't understand, and this is something, you know, I, I advertise this all the time, like ask why. So if you don't exactly. understand, ask why, why do I need to follow low potassium? Can you explain to me? And it really needs to go beyond just the, because you have kidney disease conversation. Mm -hmm. Like they need to show you in your medical history. They need to show you in your medications, in your lab work, like, see, we're tracking this here. And this is showing us that it's a little too much and we want to be careful. So make sure you get that solid understanding. Doctors don't have all the time to go through into those details. And that's why I say, you know, ask to see a dietitian if they do want mm -hmm. you to be on a any kind of dietary restriction because a dietitian, like that's what we do. That's what we spend our whole session talking exactly. about is the food and the diet and why. And I always explain to my clients why we're following this because everybody should have that understanding. And if anyone out there is worried that, hey, my insurance isn't going to cover visiting a mm -hmm. dietitian, talk to your doctor. Chances are you've got something that they can code it as to get you some visits. Maybe you need to lose a little weight. This is a good time mm -hmm. to say, doc, look, I got a few extra pounds. Can you can you code it for me to go see a dietitian? I got to lose some weight. Um, they can look at things, your blood sugar. They may be able to find ways to get you covered to go oh, see yeah. a, a dietitian. And if they can't, it is by far the best money you're gonna spend. You are investing in your future, in your quality of life. So I encourage everyone, that is where, you know, don't buy these pills, the voodoo pills out there that claim to do stuff, they don't do anything. Yeah. Spend your money learning about nutrition from a, a renal dietitian who's going to help you. And you're not gonna be seeing them every day for a month or anything like that. You're gonna see them, they're gonna teach you stuff. Or even like Jen's courses, for six weeks, they're learning different things. And during that, all of a sudden, food starts opening up. They're like, holy cow, I can eat that. <gasps> I'm not afraid to eat anymore. Oh, it, yeah. life comes back when yeah, you understand yeah. nutrition, you work with a dietitian. <laughs> and then other thing too, we did a whole other episode. It was a while mm -hmm. ago, but we did an episode about that step-by-step -step guide of what to ask yep. your insurance about finding coverage for a dietitian. So I have the blog on my website. Um, I think it's under the, my new sections under lifestyle. But if you go to my website and just search like insurance guide, you'll see the article that comes up and it's literally a step-by-step -step question and answer. Like this is what you need to ask and this is what you need to find out from your doctor. And um, it, it'll help you find out exactly what you're covered for to see a yeah. dietitian. Which is awesome. Now back to potassium. So if yes. I'm on a low potassium diet, about how mm -hmm. much potassium is that in a day? So in general, it's going to be 
around two to three thousand milligrams okay so again we're not talking about a zero milligram diet so it sounds like a lot but the recommended dietary allowance is or daily allowance is 4700 milligrams of potassium so this is a pretty significant cut from the estimated amount that the majority of the population benefits from in including in their diet. So two to 3000 milligrams per day is really what we're looking at for a low potassium diet to get a little bit more specific because that's a pretty big range still, a thousand milligram mm -hmm. range from one side to the other. So to get a more specific range, you're going to want to talk with your own healthcare professional, with your own dietitian to see where you fall on that scale, if you fall in there at all. Uh, so that is the full day. When we're looking at per food, a low potassium food is going to be under 150 milligrams. A medium potassium food is going to be 150 to like 200 or maybe 250. And then high potassium will be definitely over 250 milligrams per serving. And again, that's where it's really important to understand the foods and the serving sizes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, we want to check as well as before you even look to see how much should I be eating, it may be really important to find out how much you're actually eating in the first place to see if you do need to cut back. Maybe you're already not eating very much potassium. Most Americans don't get enough potassium anyway. So maybe you're already on like a self-prescribed low potassium <laughs> diet and you just don't realize it. Yeah. Now, when it comes to eating plant-based, we've seen all the evidence that there is so many benefits. And we even did a video, I think it was last week, about going plant-based for those with kidney disease. And if you're mm -hmm. out there and you're not 100% plant-based, that's okay, but uh, get more and more plant-based in your diet. It's, it's good for you. But it seems like everything pretty much has some potassium in it. Is it oh, yeah. possible to, to be eating plant-based and still be on a low potassium diet? Yes, absolutely. It is very, very possible. Something that I think a lot of people don't realize is how much potassium is actually in animal foods and animal products. And I mean, I was just saying this earlier on Instagram, like poor fruits and vegetables that as soon as we think of low potassium, like why do they get cut first? Why is it right away people just go to fruits and vegetables and assume, well, can't They're do like, that tomatoes anymore. Tomatoes gone, oranges gone, exactly. bananas gone, avocado gone, all that good stuff. Oh. Exactly, but we don't think about the processed meats and how they can be oh. so high in potassium. I mean, even something like fish can be higher in potassium than their plant counterparts or some different plant swaps. I mean, salmon is over 500 milligrams potassium just for a three ounce serving. Ooh, that, that's a lot of potassium. Yeah, that, exactly. That be, and, and when it comes to say, I'm not a fish person, but I've seen my, my wife loves salmon. I, I don't see her eating three ounces. She, she likes, big pieces of salmon <laughs> and then some asparagus and some lemon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's another thing about those portion sizes. And sometimes people need to go back to basics and just start tracking their food. And we've talked mm -hmm. about chronometer, like you love yep. that. I love it. That's, as the, a that's the app I use on my food or my phone to track everything I eat. I, I haven't done very good in the last year because I feel very comfortable <laughs> knowing what I eat and my waistline has shown me I'm not accurate with my mind. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's what I use. And your blog has a link to it, correct? For those that want to download it. Yeah, the I have an affiliate link. Um, so I earn a percent of from this affiliate link, but through my link, it actually is cheaper for people to enroll there because there's a 10% discount. So uh, if you're interested in trying chronometer, you can check that out. It's something I highly, highly recommend. Uh, I, I've i looked as a dietitian, I've looked at a lot of different types of food trackers and I love chronometer. Uh, that The fact that it tracks Prowl is just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And all the details and adding in custom recipes and everything is absolutely fantastic. So I would really recommend that. Um, to start just by seeing how much potassium you're getting in your diet in the first place. Yeah, and, and I'm going to plug the app also just for a reason. I love it. There's a free version that you could use to track things, or you can pay for their service 
and I pay for the service. And what I love about it is I can set my limits. Like, hey, here's how much sodium, potassium, phosphorus. It tracks like all the micronutrients. But mm -hmm. more importantly, I can go to the web and get all these reports and charts. And my doctor has my login and my dietitian has my login. So as long as I'm tracking my food, they can go in there and see how I'm doing. And in the beginning, when, when my labs were really difficult, when I was like, look, I don't want to go on dialysis. What can we do? We mm -hmm. looked at my labs and how did I eat? Okay, that's why this is here. This is why this is getting better because you're doing this and all that just worked together to help me not only stay focused, but to see progress with what I was mm -hmm. doing. Because sometimes not everything goes great. Something goes up and something goes down, but they could point to it. Hey, this is probably why this is going down. Great job right. there. This one's going up. It's probably because of this. You gotta, you know, I know you love the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Let's cut them all out for now and see what happens. Yeah. That type of stuff. It was great for motivation. Yeah, yeah. So um, what are some low potassium vegetables? I know people are going to ask, what can I eat? And I see <laughs> Cheryl saying, oh, one of my favorites, can you eat watermelon every day? I love watermelon. As a matter of fact, I did a whole video about watermelon shortly after I was diagnosed because summer came and I'm like, I got to have my watermelon. I love it. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, Cheryl, you'll be happy to find out that watermelon is a low potassium fruit. So the watermelon gets a, a bad rap because people like to overdo it. And again, it goes back to the portion. So watermelon in a half cup portion is considered a low potassium food. But if you have it in larger quantities, if it's really uh, something that you're enjoying a lot of or very frequently, it could add up and it could be a lot of potassium for you. It could go over your potassium goal. But watermelon in of itself is not the enemy. It is a low potassium fruit. So low pot other, I'll, I'll do some low potassium fruits first since we kind of started off with that watermelon trend. So James, your favorite, apples. Oh, apples of course. Is and, and the reason I love apples isn't just because low potassium, it's fiber, variety, and yes. flexibility. So much I can do yes. with apples. Exactly. So then on that same trail, we have applesauce. Uh, be careful with apple juice because I have mm. found the potassium to be pretty sneaky, really with a lot of juices, but apple juice in particular, I used to see it on some renal lists and when I went to go check different labels in the store, I was like, no, this isn't consistent enough to be mm -hmm. like a across the board. So especially with juices, be careful. Other juices that could be better options would be grape juice or pineapple juice. Those could be a lower potassium option for your juices. Um, you also have the berries. So we have blueberries, we have cherries, we have raspberries and strawberries, which we just got some strawberries yesterday. And it is strawberry season. I am so, so thrilled. <laughs> so they're cheap got... and plentiful. <laughs> exactly. And they have a lot of vitamin C. So they're great to eat with our food to help with iron absorption, which is good for anemia prevention. So benefits there as well. We also have grapes. We have the citrus like lemon and lime. These are things that we can mm. add flavor to our foods. We don't have to, we're not going to sit there and, and chow down on a lemon or a lime, but we can use it to flavor our water. We can use it to flavor our food, to add to salad dressings Those or are to marinades. Great on, lemon and lime are great on, you know, like chicken, which isn't mm -hmm. plant-based, but I do eat some chicken breast from time to time. It's great on practically everything. As a matter of fact, those are the two, uh, they're not a spice, but before I spice something up, that's the first oh, yeah. two things I, I reach for. It's either lemon, lime, or a combination. And I put it on all my stuff and then I figure out a few little extra spices, maybe some pepper or something to add to something. And I mm -hmm. am in heaven. It's yeah. amazing yeah. how much that can change the flavor of something and make it even more enjoyable. Right. And without any extra salt. So that is just absolutely a fantastic way to get more flavor. So some of the other fruits that um, that we can look at for low potassium include, as I mentioned, the pineapple or pineapple juice, um, rhubarb, which is not commonly thought of, but that is low. It's not a favorite of mine. 
<laughs> I've tried rhubarb pie once. Once. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Never again. <laughs> well, for those that are interested, like rhubarb or strawberry rhubarb, that is a low potassium combination, even mandarin oranges and tangerines. So people think of oranges as being high potassium. But if you look for the alternatives, those are lower in potassium because they're smaller. They already have kind of a portion size control there. Yep. Now, what about vegetables? And I'll tell you, I'm pretty sure I had a low potassium lunch today. I've had, yeah. I, I've been on a kick. Okay. It's spring. Fresh food is getting so easy to get and so affordable. So I, yeah. I've had asparagus every day, um, mm -hmm. just roasting it with some, some lemon and some black pepper and boom, I'm mm -hmm. great. So good. Um, asparagus. I've had like eggplant, red peppers, mm -hmm. um, zucchini and squash. That was my lunch today. That's what I had for lunch. <laughs> Oh yeah. It was it was delicious. Oh, my wife's like, is it that all you're good. gonna eat? I was like, oh, this is this is a great meal right here. And, and yeah. three years ago, I would have been like, give me a Whopper and a Big Mac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Both of those for a meal. No wonder, you know, <laughs> I wasn't doing too good. But what are oh. some low potassium vegetables? Because I know that asparagus is on there. Yeah, asparagus is one. That is one that you definitely want to. I kind of like watermelon asparagus can you can kind of eat a lot of it maybe or you don't realize so you want to keep your portions again in control with all of these vegetables so we're looking at a half cup of uh, cooked a cup of fresh or two cups of leafy greens for those serving sizes um, but some other ones so all the ones you mentioned bamboo shoots which is another great oh, yeah. addition into stir fries and salads so you can do that. You can do broccoli. You can do cauliflower. Those cruciferous greens are really great. Uh, green beans are great. Uh, cucumber, mushrooms. Um, the white mushrooms in particular are going to be lower in potassium. Uh, tomatillos, which can be an excellent swap for your salsas. If you like to have salsa with your chips, take out some of those tomatoes, which, which are higher in potassium and add in some tomatillos that still give it that tomato type, like those, all those salsa verdes, basically. It gives it that. I, am, I always learn something cool when we talk about food. I have no clue what those are. Really? I'm going to find out. Okay, so when you I'm look I'm gonna add it to my list of nutritional yeast, all the other goodies mm -hmm. that I've learned from you. Oh, I'm so excited for you. So, I mean, I was like born and raised in Arizona. So in the Southwest, you know, salsa and all of that is, is mm -hmm. pretty, I love salsa. It's, it's our thing. It's our thing. So tomatillos, think of it as like a little green tomato. It's not nearly as water-based mm -hmm. as, you know, tomatoes, when you crack them open, they're pretty watery inside. They have a lot of liquid. Tomatillos do not have as much water, um, but they add a really nice, bright, freshness it, it's kind of hard it's like almost like a little bit more of a tart tomato because tomatoes do have a little bit of sweetness to them yeah. um but tomatillos i tell you if you add just a little bit of those to your salsa and then if you want to balance it with some sweetness you could add a little bit of corn to that oh, yeah. really really good oh, that sounds good oh i'm, I'm gonna look it up i'm gonna try okay it. Right? okay i've only had definitely. a few things that i wasn't too thrilled with that i tried like the mushrooms yeah. and that, that was me cooking them. I waited too long and I know I cooked them wrong. I'm going to mm -hmm. give them a second try somewhere in the, yeah. at a restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. Pedro says he loves tomatillos. If I pronounce tomatillo. it right. Tomatillo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are really, really great. Um, another one that I think is underrated is water chestnuts. Mm -hmm. Those make a great, crunchy, flavorful, not well, flavorful in the sense that like they will take on flavors of what you put in. So stir fries, salads, yes. it's just a and nice little addition. I like the yeah. little crunch that they add to stir fry. Yeah, me too. It's, it's almost like um, a softer carrot, I think, mm -hmm. or like a more. Actually, I think it's more of a, it's a, it's a crisper carrot, but it's not hard if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Like there's more water in it, but it's not that tough. It's not as as solid or firm or tough. Or, mm -hmm. I don't know. 
No, but it's great in stir fry. I'll mix a few of yeah. those up and it doesn't take much and you can cut them up. I like not cutting them up. I love, it's, oh, yeah. like, a, it's like a reward when you find one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's low potassium, so you can definitely fit it in. So when you're, when you're putting together a meal in the low potassium diet, this is something that you can focus on more foods coming from these low potassium foods rather than the high potassium. And um, I was just explaining this earlier, like think of it like a math equation where you've got to get to 10. So you can do five plus five, still mm -hmm. comes out to 10, or you can do one plus one plus one plus one plus one. And that can all end up e equaling 10, but you have so much more there. So when we focus on the low potassium diet, including more of your fruit and vegetable choices to come from the low potassium side, you're going to give yourself more variety. You're going to give yourself more fiber, more nutrients, all these different colors that you're including in the diet, rather than thinking of being restrictive to only one or two high potassium foods. Yep. So like, like if I chose avocado, that's a higher uh, potassium food. So I'm going to have less of it and mm -hmm. I'm going to have less other items. Um, I like to think of it as an allowance, you know, like yeah. my allowance is 10. And this one's two points. This one's seven points. Mm -hmm. I can fit it in, but right. then I got to be really careful the rest of the day. Is that what I want to do? And that's kind of how I look at bananas, tomatoes, avocados. I still mm -hmm. get avocados and bananas in my diet um, mm -hmm. with no problem. And I, and I do need more potassium. So it, it is easier for me to fit it in. Um, but I actually have to purposely get more potassium. I, mm -hmm. I almost eat a lower potassium or maybe a normal potassium diet for what we're supposed to eat. And I have to eat a little bit more of those. Now, yeah, what I about, mean, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you probably <laughs> fall into that category of the majority of Americans not getting enough potassium in their diet. It's, it's just way, way too common. So yeah. um, easy to, easy to find ways to just start by looking at how much you're already getting to see if you need to further restrict it because you might already be restricting. Mm -hmm. Now, what about low potassium proteins? And I know this is where there's some nuts. Yeah, yeah. And this is, again, where we think about if you need to follow a low potassium diet, we're not just looking at fruits and vegetables. We want to look at other areas because proteins, we've talked about this before, many people with kidney disease need to follow a low protein diet. So if you're already looking at cutting back on your proteins, it could be really doubly beneficial if you pull back on these high protein foods that also have potassium in them. So in this case, if you want to have protein in your diet, if you need to have protein in your diet, the lower protein options are cottage cheese and eggs. So some of those animal products, tofu mm -hmm. is lower in potassium compared to some other plant products. Uh, tuna is a lower potassium fish. And then we have pecans and walnut for lower potassium nuts. And then uh, seitan, which is vital wheat gluten. It's, it's what a lot of companies use for those meat replacement products. That is also lower in potassium. Cool. And I love eggs. Eggs are, in the beginning, that was my big go-to because I could mix things in it like cinnamon and it tastes mm -hmm. like dessert. I know it sounds bizarre to all of you out there. You're like, it does. James, what the heck are you doing with cinnamon and eggs? A little bit of cream cheese, a little bit of cinnamon, make up those scrambled eggs. Oh my goodness. It was my version of a Cinnabon. I know it's not a comparison, <laughs> But it gives it that cinnamon bun flavor. You 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 remember being back at the mall and you're like, oh, this is delicious. <laughs> I mean, the closest I can understand this is like French toast, where people would scramble up your eggs, yeah. you'd mix up the eggs, and then you'd add in the cinnamon and you'd have the bread sit in there. So I'm like, okay, I have seen eggs mixed with cinnamon before. Mm -hmm. Not unheard of. Um I've not tried it and I feel like I probably should. So, you know, you've tried things that I've talked about. I think it's probably my turn to try things you've talked about. So I can. When, when I first got started, I was like, okay, I need help. I got, how do I get rid of McDonald's? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm a, I, I've got this, these cravings for McDonald's. How do I get rid of them? And they, and they, they helped me come up with a fake McChicken sandwich. 
and I, I, I that got me off McDonald's. I was like, hey, I was a big guy, okay, guys? I was pushing a lot of pounds. I was like, Cinnabon is my weakness at the mall. I can get past Auntie M and all of them, but Cinnabon, I'm stopping there. What can I do? And someone told me, you know, a little bit of cream cheese, some cinnamon, and scrambled eggs, mm. and that'll take care of your Cinnabon um, cravings that you have. And I cannot believe it. It it it, it worked. Very interesting. <laughs> so so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, what about low potassium grains? Yeah, and that's another one that, again, fruits and vegetables are, they really take the hit for a low potassium diet, but there are other aspects of your diet that you can cut down potassium without having to sacrifice your favorite fruits and vegetables, and grains are one of them. So some of the grains that are lower in potassium include brown rice, which we've talked about as a great thing to include. It has fiber in it. There's mm -hmm. also bulgur. There's your pastas, of course. Um, I will say some of the pasta alternatives that are out there, like there's an entire aisle dedicated to pastas now. So you've got to be careful with the exact kind you choose because the ones that are based by lentils or uh, legumes of some sort, those will probably have higher potassium content because of simply they're made from those sources that are higher in potassium compared to the flours that are not high in potassium. So just regular old pasta, white or wheat even is fine. Uh, popcorn is a low potassium option. Even your whole wheat grains or whole wheat bread is going to still be considered a low potassium food because it falls under that 150 milligrams per serving. So these are some great potassium or low potassium grains that you can include still excuse me, on a low potassium diet. Now, and I like to make oatmeal from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna sound odd, but now that I think about my diet, it really is odd. To me, oatmeal is like a dessert. I'll make mm -hmm. a little bit of oatmeal and I'll put, I'll go a little heavy in the cinnamon. <laughs> and it's delicious. And oh, yeah. that's that can be considered a low potassium. Yeah, oatmeal is also considered low in potassium, um, especially like those packets. If you just mm -hmm. get a plain, regular, nothing added to a packet, that is a pre-portioned low potassium serving right there. Uh, the canisters work fine too, but the great thing about the packets is that they're already portioned out for you in that low potassium serving. Yeah, and when it comes to the pasta, I love the zucchini noodles. Oh yeah, and I've zucchini is low in potassium. Like two weeks now, uh, I, I still haven't had any meat. Yeah, I haven't had any meat. Hey, it's, look at I you. Think it's, it's probably getting close to three weeks now. It's, it's over two Good weeks, job. two and a half weeks. And oh, oh, let me awesome. tell you, my cooking skills, something happened. I don't know what happened. Like, like a whole bunch of YouTube videos went in my mind or something from cooking channels. <laughs> I'm in there, I'm mixing stuff up, I'm grabbing tools out of the drawers, spatula stuff before none of that stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was awful. That's exciting. Yeah. My wife oh, was yelling really me, awesome. not that in that pan. <laughs> you know, now I know what ones go where. <laughs> there can be a little bit of learning curve for that. I, 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 I get it. <laughs> yep. Now what about drinks that are low potassium? So we don't want to forget about those. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was uh, looking into like this whole section, because I knew we definitely want to talk about low potassium drinks, it made me think about our episode about coffee. And we talked about some of those coffee drinks that were way high in potassium, like over 500 milligrams a serving that they get up there really high. But just regular plain black coffee is low in potassium as long as you keep to a, a, a fairly reasonable amount one to two cups a day is going to be reasonable so apple juice but again be really mindful of reading that label for for apple juice the ready to drink coconut milk is considered a low potassium drink now this can vary from brand to brand so again it's mm -hmm. very very important and i really can't say that enough for especially for anything that's packaged 
because they can add things into it. They can modify it or tweak it or whatever the case is. So really make sure you read these labels. But um, some other option would be cranberry juice. I mentioned the pineapple juice, grape juice. Uh, ginger ale is a low potassium drink. And lemonade is another one that works out really well, especially uh, homemade lemonade for kidney stones, prevention of that. Rice milk is a low potassium drink as well for a milk alternative. And then just some nice like sun tea some or, or some brewed tea is a low potassium drink as well. Great. Now we talked about drinks, mm -hmm. some fruits, some vegetables, some protein. Now the most important thing of the entire day the snack category. What the are some low category. potassium snacks? Yeah, I can't I can't leave you guys hanging with that, right? Well, we did talk about using the tomatillos for a salsa. So chips and salsa, tortilla chips by themselves look for low sodium. Um, you don't need to do no added salt necessarily. If you find them and you're okay with them, that works. But at least look for some that are low in salt. I love the late July brand for tortilla chips that are lower in sodium, but they as they have the lime on there as well. So again, that adds that flavor. Mm -hmm. So make a salsa that uses a little bit more of the lower potassium vegetables like tomatillo, onion. You could still do some tomato in there, um, but just don't make it be like the main star of the show. So choose a or make your own salsa, play around with the flavors of it, put a lot of garlic and cilantro in there, maybe a little bit of jalapeno peppers or bell peppers for additional sweet and spice to it. You can do popcorn. So I see skinny popcorn. Yeah, skinny popcorn is a good option. Um, they have so many flavors out. It's kind of hard to keep track, but you can do some popcorn. I love adding nutritional yeast for a savory popcorn or with cinnamon for like a sweeter dessert popcorn. And <laughs> lime. I love lime in my popcorn. Oh, another, well, that's a good one too. Another odd thing that I've discovered plain popcorn squeeze take a whole line cut it mm -hmm. in, in, in quarters squeeze it then i mix it all up and oh it just adds just the right amount of ooh when you get the mm -hmm. when you get a piece with it on there it's delicious oh that's fantastic <laughs> yeah i i think i mean citrus yeah it goes so underrated for adding flavor but there, it is so incredibly versatile we could probably do like a whole episode talking about different ways to use citrus <laughs> Yep, it's an awesome thing now what if i'm somebody who is like <clears throat> you know i love my potatoes mm -hmm. how can i reduce besides getting to a smaller portion how can i reduce the potassium in something like a potato so there is a lot of thought around this older idea of soaking. And I hear people all the time, even now, still talk about it. But soaking, just simply soaking your potatoes is not very effective when it comes to lowering the potassium. And again, we're talking about potassium and not phosphorus. Phosphorus is in a different, whole different category, not something that we're looking at when it comes to potatoes, for example. So we're talking about lowering potassium. The soaking method, not very effective. What is more effective and research and proven to be effective is the double boiling method. So the great thing about this is that you can get it done in a shorter period of time because you don't need to let your potatoes sit overnight to do this. So to do the double, uh, the double boiling method, you want to make sure you wash and peel your potatoes and then you cut them into small, like one or half inch cubes. You put it in a big pot of cold water and make sure the potatoes are very well submerged in the water. You bring it to a boil, you let it boil for 10 to 15 minutes. Then after that, you turn off the heat, you drain, rinse those potatoes, fill that pot with fresh cold water, put mm -hmm. potatoes back in, bring it back to a boil for another 10 to 15 minutes. And then after that, your potatoes are officially double boiled and you can prep them, cook them however you like to moving forward. So you can saute them, you can roast them or bake them, you can mash them. 
whatever you like, you can even freeze them. So you can double boil them and then freeze them to be used later on. That way, all of that double boiling work has already been taken care of ahead of time. Yep. And the nice thing is when you're dumping out that water, guys, you're dumping out some of the potassium. It got pulled mm -hmm. out, leached out into the water. Yep. So you're dumping that out, rinsing it off, filling it back up, doing it again. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm somebody who is on a low potassium diet, how long do I probably need to be on that low potassium diet? Is this something that I do for a couple weeks and then things are back to normal and I can jump off of it? Or does this become more of a, a lifestyle for me? Well, for many cases, it is potentially just like a temporary resolution that you may or may not need to continue on. In many cases, for example, for somebody on dialysis, this is a medically induced situation where the potassium will need to be better regulated for a longer period of time. Not everybody on dialysis needs to be on a low potassium diet. In fact, some people on dialysis need a high potassium diet. I've had clients who had to keep cases of coconut water on standby because they couldn't, they, they needed to take more potassium even on dialysis. So again, we can't say this whole group of people needs to be on low potassium, but really it's all about going off of your labs and however that lab schedule is set up, that's determined between you and your doctor. Um, and you can talk with your doctor about it. If your potassium is quite high, many times they will order a stat repeat um, so they'll get another redraw pretty soon afterwards. It could be in a couple days. It could be in a week. It really, really depends on how high and what the situation is. If it's something that's, if it's something that happens pretty frequently, you might just be getting it checked more often. Uh, there's so many different cases as to what's going on. But if your potassium comes back down in range, it's not necessarily that you can go back to eating a whole bunch of foods that are high in potassium, but you may have some more wiggle room depending mm -hmm. on what your treatment plan is at that time. Whether medication changes happened, you had some more permanent, like you realized there was something in your diet that you didn't realize had potassium and you just took that out because you didn't know. You know, I've, I've had it very often where somebody didn't realize it. they got, they had this new sports drink or they had some kind of new thing that they were trying out that they yep. thought was helping them, but it just was shooting their potassium up. So we just took that back out and their potassium is back down again. So it's going to be really different for every single person, but the labs will really give an idea about that progress. And if it's something that you need to continue and you'll want to talk with your doctor about what that means for you. Now, what if I'm on a low potassium diet? I'm doing good. I'm not cheating. I'm sticking to it but my potassium is still out of control. It's still too high. What are some other options for me? So luckily there are other options and your doctor will probably be talking with you about some of these things, but you can also bring them up with your doctor. So for one example, medications. Medications, as mentioned, can have a factor in or can have a role that plays into your potassium balance. So there's some medications that regulate blood pressure that may keep your potassium a little bit higher. And talking with your doctor about an alternative to some of those medications may be helpful in keeping your potassium better controlled. Your doctor might start you on something more consistently like lactulose, which is used for a multitude of reasons. Um, but one of the results of lactulose is the lowering of potassium. So your doctor might have you on a routine of that. Uh, you can talk with your doctor about other laxatives that help with possibly chronic constipation. Although from a dietary standpoint, I do always encourage finding out really what's going on for those reasons rather than just covering them up with medications. But that is really a whole nother story, a whole nother show. <laughs> um, so there's a whole nother section of medications called potassium binders. And Many people know about phosphorus binders, but there are potassium binders. The potassium binders are a medication that you usually take like twice per day. It's not like phosphorus binders that you take with each meal. Hopefully binders for phosphorus will soon follow this trend that potassium binders have found. Um, but the potassium binders are oftentimes prescribed 
for long-term control of potassium. And this is going to be something that needs to come from your doctor. It is a prescription. And there are a few out there that are fairly well known. If you have a dietitian you're working with, your dietitian may also advocate for that. But generally, they'll try to first look at some other interventions in your diet to help with regulating that potassium. But know that there are such a thing as potassium binders. And if you're interested in exploring that opportunity, that could be a great conversation to have with your doctor to see if that's something that you would benefit from. Then, oh, I know I'm rambling on. <laughs> no, 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 you're good, you're good, you're good. Okay, okay. So uh, another area that can be quite influential in your potassium control is your blood sugar control. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with the way, uh, getting into like the biochemistry of it all and, and the physiology of it, it has to do with basically the push and pull of these different nutrients in and out of the cell. And having poorly regulated blood sugars can lead to this situation of high potassium. So it's, it's important to know what your blood sugar control looks like and talk with your doctor about uh, your blood sugar control. If you have diabetes, what you can do there if that is also coming up as an issue. If your A1C is in the eights and nines and your potassium is also kind of hard to control, again, looking at that root cause of, okay, maybe it's the, or maybe it's the blood sugars that we need to focus on to help with potassium management. Yeah, very, very good. And look at this, we are pretty much at the top of the hour and we got through all of our key points. Woo! <laughs> Now, there was one question I wanted to answer. I'm delaying us. Uh, it is off topic, but Tim asked me, and I love questions like this. He's like, James, what camera are you using? He's setting up a studio to do videos like this, but about uh, parent coaching to help people. And, you know, in case anybody else is out there is interested, I'm not using a webcam. I'm using a DSLR, it's a Canon M50 with a uh, 16 millimeter Sigma lens, which when I don't have my green screen, it blurs the background, it looks great. Um, I love this camera because it's super simple, it looks good, and it kind of thins out these wrinkles. Look at that, you guys don't see any of them. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> But I saw this question, I was like, anyone who's out there who's wanting to do this type of stuff on their own, create videos and YouTube, I'm always happy to let you know, hey, here's what I'm using. Um, yeah. And Tim, you can email me and I'll tell you all about all the equipment that I use and why. Um, mm -hmm. I started out, I, I ended up wasting so much money because I would buy something be like, meh, that's, that's not exactly right. Um, I wish I would have had someone to say, hey, here's what I use and why. And then I could have made decisions to to get me where I am today sooner. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to answer that question for him while we were here. And boom, oh, someone else had asked me, James, have you, have you eaten dinner yet? Yes, I did. Since I knew we were talking about food, I made up my <laughs> zucchini and squash and all that um, right before this. And I had some zucchini noodles. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I had zucchini, the sliced ones, and zucchini noodles with like a lemon sauce on it, like a lemon pepper sauce. Uh, I, I love lemon pepper. Those two yeah. things that go great on, on certain foods. Um, but yeah, I ate before this so that I wouldn't be getting hungry during the conversation. Because a lot of times, as soon as I'm done, I'm off. I got to eat dinner. I got to go to the grocery store or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't had dinner, but I already know. It's zucchini noodles and mushroom ravioli. That has been calling my name all day. Very good. Well, I gotta go this weekend and buy a new uh, little convection oven thing. I think I, I've mm. gotten so into cooking and I'm cooking things in this little tiny oven, not the big ones, because uh, I don't know how to use the big ones. Uh, and my wife uses them for storage, so I don't wanna take all the stuff out of them. Um, but I've been using the smaller one that we had when we had a restaurant. We used it to make fresh baked cookies. So when people walked in, it smelled really good. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of wearing out, so I need to go shopping for a new little convection toaster oven type thing. Oh, um, fun, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, I love making a lot of my food in there when the weather's not too great and I can't jump outside to the grill. Mm -hmm. 
All right, it is it is the top of the hour. Thank you so much, Jen. Another great show. And probably just a couple of quick points for everybody. If you need to be on a low potassium diet, your doctor, your dietitian, your healthcare team is the one who will tell you that that's what you need to be on. Then you can mm -hmm. ask questions. Don't do it because you saw it on Facebook or somebody else has the same GFR as you and they're on it. We all are different. And don't go too far. Don't put the brakes on too much when it comes to potassium and pretty much anything in your diet. Um, the secret to a, a, a renal diet is knowing what your limits are, kind of like that allowance, and then picking the best foods to get you to your minimum. Here's how much potassium you need, but don't go over this number. You're going to get that range right there and just making it the best decisions based on how you feel. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to have some avocado. That's going to use up a lot of my allowance, but that's okay today. Or maybe it's like, I'd rather have a whole bunch of food, so I'm going to eat all these lower potassium things. You know, That's how a renal diet works, making great choices. And you can enjoy eating, not be afraid of it. All right, okay. everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll be back in two nights. Uh, Oh, we're doing another recipe with the team from Flavis. I can't remember what we're making. Matter of fact, they haven't oh, sent it to exciting. me yet. Oh, it's going to be good. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Jen. And thanks, everybody. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye. Bye.